Hey guys, Tom Davis here, America's Canon Educator. Hope everyone is well and safe and sane. Today I'm delivering you guys something different on my YouTube channel. Shut this because somebody's mowing their grass. Oh, by the way, Lola's in here too. Hi, Lola. She's my baby. I wanted to deliver you guys some sort of content in between my dog training sessions. So today we have a very special guest, Michael Ellis. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Michael, Michael is a dog trainer based out of Santa Rosa, California. He's somebody that I've looked up to uh, my entire career working with dogs. I started watching Michael train at a very early part of my career so it was a pleasure to have him on it was a great honor uh, to, to be able to chat dogs with him so uh, I hope you guys like this video and again this is something new I'm just doing it for you guys first and then it's gonna go into audio format on my podcast and of course as you guys know this episode of the podcast is brought to you by my friends over at Dogtra. Dogtra of course is the remote collar that I use in all of my YouTube videos as well as talk about here on the podcast you can use the promo code NBD10 to get 10% off your entire purchase at dogtra.com so thank you dogtra for sponsoring this podcast i appreciate it and so anyway guys it's something new if if you guys could just leave a comment in the comments below let me know if you guys want more of this i know it's a discussion that we've talked about before on my channel i think for me like i would want to watch two professionals talk together like it's nice to have the podcast i think it's a great format but at the same time i think it's also nice to be able to like watch two trainers and two professions and gen two professionals in general just have a conversation i think kind of having the nuances of of communicating with each other and laughing and smiling and looking at each other i think it's just a different uh perspective of the conversation so anyway if you guys like this don't forget to like this video leave a comment in the comments below and let me know if you want more of this i'll certainly i do a lot of podcasts so i'll certainly uh, produce this more often or if there's different camera angles or different things you guys want to see let me know in the pot in the podcast in the comments below Hello. I appreciate you guys very much. I have some exciting things, like I said, coming up. Some really great videos that we're putting together and some plans. Uh, I appreciate you guys. Thank you so much. I will talk to you later. Bye. I can. How you doing, Tom? Good, man. How are you? Not bad at all, considering this craziness. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, what's what's California like right now? Uh, I, I assume it's like other places, but I don't know for sure. Uh, you guys... We're we're just beginning to start kind of reopening stuff up again a little bit. Like, so they have a whole protocol in place. So phases for the reopening. So, uh, certain businesses are now allowed to reopen with social distancing and masks and limits to the number of people that can be in a certain spot and all that kind of thing. Hmm. Disinfecting stuff. And, um, and they're gradually doing it in phases to come back through. So I think we'll probably resume some in-person classes at the school in June. June, uh, but uh, yeah, so I'm doing everything online right now. So that's good. That's good. At least you got to do something. There's a lot of people that are like completely screwed. Just, oh yeah. no, it's crazy. Can't do anything. Yeah. So cool. it, we're, it's kind of forced changes on us that, uh, that we were planning anyway. So I was planning on offering, uh, live online versions of lots of our classes. And so, yeah. Uh, so I, how I worked out the technology for that, and so I'm doing it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Just, just, just ran the first one, so Ad it went, it adapt. What? Yeah. Uh, how are? So how does that work? Are you? Are you just? Are you doing the, everything that you would teach all your curriculum and sessions just, just like this online? Yeah. So basically, we, you know, at the school, the train, the big training room. Yeah. We run all our classes in. Yeah. We, I, I got good cameras we've got cameras in there so that you can see the whole room from any angle you can zoom in or out that whole thing i have a remote mic and you run it off zoom i have a big screen so i can see oh that's cool students faces and when they ask questions they pop up and that's great and then they can do practicals too from their end like so you can watch it, them yeah so the same thing we just flip it over and they stand up and they run practicals and then we with larger classes, we'll have the ability to break out and use the breakout room feature that Zoom has. I don't know whether you messed with it much. Not, but. No, this is like yeah. my third Zoom. I did right, yeah. <laughs> I, I did a do, Zoom with Dogtra and another company, and this is my third third Zoom. I'm usually just on Skype or FaceTime. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I the, the quality of the image and the sound and stuff, I've had zero problems. I ran a behavior mod class that was two weeks, and I had students from Singapore, Italy, Spain, two from Canada, and then several around the US. And we had zero technical glitches. I could see everybody here, everybody they could see here, me. It was 
great. It's kind of it scary. Cool. Where you're like, wait, what have Marvel. I been? What have I been? What have I been doing all these years? I should have just been doing this. Do right. the old pajamas on the bottom and uh, shirt on top. It's exactly right, man. It's exactly right. That's so it's, it's cool. It's very. It seems sort of futuristic, but it's it's the time is here. It's totally doable. So. Exactly. It's that. That's why I, I was. I, I've been talking to some people in the industry about. Um, how this works and, and things like that. Um, and a lot of people are, you know, forced to adapt. Luckily for trainers like you and I, it's like I've had the online stuff in place too. And I've kind of switched it over to, um, I've gotten an influx in training and I just do an hour con like consulting, basically just yeah. helping mm -hmm. people navigate, answering Q and a type stuff, uh, really helpful stuff. If you're sitting at home wondering what else, you know, what else to do. Yeah. So That's it's, been. it's, yeah, it's been really good. So I was I was lucky to kind of just shift right into it. We just got busier, but I actually started shutting <clears throat> shutting it down on my end because it was just it was too much. You know, after like the you know, as you know, just teaching um after like 6 the 6th hour, you're you're not as present as you should be, maybe. Yeah. And and so <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> yeah, I I started kind of like pulling back the reins a little bit and I was like, wow, you know, this is this isn't, you know, this is probably going to go on for a while, especially in New York. It's it's not uh you know, we have to we have to I'm in upstate, so I'm um I'm closer to Vermont and Canada than I am. Yeah. Where are you? So I'm in close to Saratoga Springs, yeah. um yeah. right outside yeah. of Albany. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I used to I spent a fair amount of time there when we were in New York. I I would run up to train with clubs. There was a club right outside of Albany that I trained with all the time. Yeah, so, I had a, a couple of the guys. Yeah, a couple of the guys that I train with, uh, that I'm friends with, like on Facebook or something. Like posted a picture of you training with them in New York. Um, Ed Myers, do you remember Ed Myers? Oh yeah, yeah, uh huh. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> it was funny. He put. I'm like, wait. And then I started kind of digging into some of your some of your older stuff that you actually lived in. Do you lived in New York City, right? Yeah, we lived. Uh, uh, my wife Carol went to grad school at Columbia, so we were in in uh, New York City for four years. Well, on the uh, kind of Upper West Side, right near Columbia, like hundred. That's cool. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, I remember. Was, I'd run around and train all over in the like out on Long Island and upstate, yeah. out to Jersey, all that kind of stuff. You know. That's cool. <laughs> now, for <clears throat> just so you know, Michael, like my listeners are everything from dog trainers to dog lovers to people who just stumbled upon a, a random podcast when they're bored. Um, cool. but predominantly just people who are, you know, interested in dogs and, uh, and getting into dog training and or have dogs and so on and so forth. So, um, why don't you just, if you, if you could, well, first question I have really quick, I want to rewind before I forget. How, so how does the behavior modification work on your end with the online stuff? Do are you just going through curriculum or do they actually have a dog that they're? Yeah. So it, it, I'm going through curriculum. So the way it's set up is we have, um, I run through kind of my ideas in general about behavior mod. Uh, it's a holistic approach and mm -hmm. uh, diagnosis of problems and taking histories and um, kind of getting to the root of things, coming up with uh, management and obedience plan in combination and then finally dealing with the kind of pathology itself. And so um, I kind of review a lot of the obedience techniques that are necessary. I review management techniques, which are hugely important if you're going to be successful with any behavior mod, you know, right. breaking the cycle, and cool. all those sorts of things. And then um, I have video uh, to talk dog body language and things like that and video specific problems. And then what would be kind of some, uh, typical protocols for common behavioral issues, right? Right, And cool. we talk about the different types of aggression and separation anxiety and obsessive compulsive disorders and all that kind of stuff, right? Cool. So so that's pretty successful then. You can go through all the all of the the background stuff and the fundamentals of why these behaviors are are there. And that's cool. I was just curious. So, yeah, and I'm targeting it towards obviously dog trainers. So yeah. people are going to be doing it professionally. So yeah. sections in it where we talk about like how you – you know, get clients to give you honest histories without feeling judged and <laughs> yeah. you know, the stuff that's necessary, you know, how you get people to kind of buy into the yeah. management protocols that are sometimes. That's awesome. I want to, that's cool. I, Cause I was curious, I saw that, uh, and uh, I have, uh, there's a lot of information that uh, I want to, I want to talk to you about. I'm really excited. Thanks for hopping on here. I appreciate it. Oh, of course. Um, 
so cool. I appreciate it. So just so just so you know, and then my listeners know, there's there's a lot of serendipitous things that 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 happen to a lot of different people. But there's an interesting story between you, and you don't know this, but when I so when so when I started getting, I've been professionally. I started dog walking, um, and and basically organically started working with all the dogs who couldn't go to doggy daycares and so on and so forth. I'm like, yeah, sure, I'll take them, whatever. You know, doing pack walks, the the usual <clears throat> suspects, if you will. And then uh, you know, just that one phone call of helping that one shepherd led to the next, and then you get it, so on and so forth. Sure. <laughs> and then it, and it just it stumbled on into you know a, a career, and I was just like. They're like, how are you doing this? And you know, the, I think it really triggered for me when <clears throat> I um I was I was working with dogs and 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 gaining a little bit more ground than some of the some of the other trainers in the area that I uh, additionally uh, or originally tried to work with. Um, and because I wasn't a trainer, I couldn't so whatever. So it kind of organically I I was pushed to the outskirts because I was young, I was wow. like nineteen. 20 years old when I was like really trying to get into it heavy. And I'm like, I wanted to learn. I didn't have any money to like learn, you know, people wanted, you know, and I get it. I get it. So, so anyway, so I talked to my friend, Janine Lazarus. Um, she's an English, uh, she's, she's an English, um, she's, she's from England. So she's, she's really funny. Uh, so basically I shadowed her. She was in the area and she actually used to do, uh, brother Christopher's, uh, remote collar classes at at the monastery. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so she, so we started getting into, um, you know, she's like, well, if you're going to do it, you know, just follow me. And she, she's funny. She's an English lady. She's to the point. She's, she's very assertive. She's like, you know, we probably as Americans would think she's rude, but she's not. She's just like, do this. And that sucks. And you know, this doesn't. <laughs> so, but, but I was just like, you know, Janine, I'm having a hard time, um, you know, conceptualizing a lot of the philosophy of dog training. I, I know how to do it, you know, and, and I'm sure you see that as a teacher, Oh, all the time. You see a lot of people who are very organically, innately gifted with working with animals, and there's a lot more to it. And we'll talk about that in a little bit about how to make that a business and grow that into a training career. But right. so she gave, she said, "You you got to watch uh, Michael Ellis." And I said, "Well, okay, where? How?" She's like, "Well, you can." go to Learburg and I said, okay, what's that? You know, and I'm like, I don't, I don't know any of these things. I'm like, you know, I pick up poop for a living at, at, you know, in my mind, you know? So anyway, so she said, no, you, 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 you have, you have what it takes, you know, uh, she saw me working with dogs. And so, so anyway, so I started watching your stuff. This was a long time ago. Um, and I can still hear Ed Frawley's voice and <laughs> <laughs> that little, people. <laughs> yeah, that little, that little jingle in the beginning, uh, so, so, I, so anyway, so I got into your stuff many, many years ago and, um, it was just a lot of, uh, and then I, and then I kind of started getting into other Learberg trainers like Forrest and, um, so on and so forth. And then, so I was like, okay, this makes sense. And you were like the first person I saw that made dog training to, in my opinion, the way that I saw it, you were the first person that I saw that actually made it look like a career. I didn't. You know, I didn't other, I didn't see other people that were, you know, cause you had your school and you were teaching. I was like, you know, people are, you know, I could, there, there's a living out there and I didn't, I, I just was young. I didn't know. So, sure. yeah. <clears throat> uh, and, and then, uh, organically I got into remote collar training, working with her and then it got into like, you know, me offering it to clients. And then, and then I, I started to realize the political standpoint of it. Um, mm-hmm. and I was like, wait, what do you mean? It's just, you know, as, as a, as a professional dog walker at the time, you know, just working with dogs in general. But anyway, so long story short, uh, it was, it was interesting because when I went out to, so I became friends with Forrest probably five years ago. We've been tight. We talk Mm -hmm. regularly. Um, and then I went out to Learburg, uh, for a Tyler Muto, uh, seminar and it was funny because after watching all your videos at the at the end, Forrest knows that I was interested in in protection work. I like the idea of it. I like the I just like getting into it. So the decoy work it was interesting to me. So he actually said, "Hey, do you want to, you want to do a little bite work after you know Tyler's thing?" I said, "Yeah, sure, that would be cool." And then he's like, "Well, uh, why don't you? I'll go grab Rush and we'll we'll do some." And I'm like, "Wait, ru- wait, Rush, Rush, like." The, like <laughs> Like Learberg, Michael Allen. Dog, right? Yeah, it was. It was just. It was just so like it kind of came full circle. So I ended up taking bites from Rush, and it was just so funny because I, I, 
I kind of like, I remember just, as you said, like so many people go through the same process with you of like remembering the old times. And I just sat on the computer and watched Rush and then I was taking bites from him, which was so cool. Um, was cool. Yeah, it just kind of like came full circle. And then um, Forrest was like, you know, because next time I went to Oregon, he's like, we should go down to Michael's school, hang out. You can meet Michael and all that stuff. I said, yeah, that would be awesome. That would be cool. And um, and then we went down and, and I know that you and Forrest hadn't trained in a while together um, and he hasn't been, he hadn't at the time been training at, at the school like he had been in the past. Yeah. And so it was kind of cool to be part of like, you know, two of the people that I kind of watched uh, help me get into the career, made me confident in the career. And then I kind of saw you guys kind of reignite your, your training uh, relationship together. And that was, that was really, pretty cool. I was really happy when Forrest landed out on the west coast and we got to spend time together again so yeah, yeah it's been it's been really good so you you hooked yourself to to the right kind of person he's a he's a super good dude yeah i love Forrest. yeah he's we got, yeah he's got training chops kind of his ears so yeah <laughs> and it's it just, i'm just like you know just listening to him talk and rant once you get him going is is always pretty fun so anyway so i just wanted to share that with you that it was is a very right. like yeah it was just a cool story how it kind of all came full circle and uh, I think you know I, I I worked really hard and just you know got my got got myself at the right place at the right time and I'm, I'm grateful for uh, getting to know you guys and be able to communicate with you guys really cool that's fabulous that's lovely to hear I mean you always it's always nice uh, when when people connect with um, the right people at the right time in their development yeah. I'm, I'm a, a big proponent of exposing yourself to lots of different trainers and lots of different ideas and that kind of thing, because you don't know when your, your growth is going to be ready to receive a certain idea. And I know certainly when I was learning about dog training right. early on, I had people tell me things and show me things that I wasn't prepared to receive at that point in time. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like I didn't have a place to put it. It all made sense. It yeah. seemed logical, but my experience, I had no place to put any of that. And so it drops yeah. away. And two years later, you're like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. that was a good idea. That was I now I know why. And it's connected. Yeah. And so by kind of um, keeping yourself open in that way, then you yeah. when you when you hit the right person at the right time, it can really move your way of thinking forward. So it's a it's a lovely thing. So. Yeah, it was very it was very organic. And, and anyway, so I just wanted to share that story with, with you and then my listeners as well, just because it was like such a full circle thing. So for those of you who don't know uh, who you are and what you do, um, just quick, you know, quickly, I don't you don't have to go through your whole your whole uh, where you started and <laughs> stuff like that. But um, why don't you just tell a little little bit about yourself, what you do, how long you've been training and, and things like that really quick. Yeah, so uh, I've been training since I was a kid. So I, I got a German Shepherd when I was uh, 12, and the parents said I had to train it. So I happened to take a class at the local German Shepherd Dog Club of San Diego, an obedience class, and then I got kind of hooked, got involved in, in junior showmanship, showing dogs in confirmation, and got into AKC obedience and all that stuff as a kid, and had German Shepherds all through junior high and high school. And so dog training was always kind of a big hobby for me. I had no intention of doing it professionally. And then when I was 18 or 19, I got connected with a sport club, uh, with a Schutzen club. I was at a dog show and saw police and Schutzen demo at a dog club. And I was dog show and I was totally stoked to do that. So I went and none of the dogs I had were suitable and I started doing decoy work. And so it was a hobby all into college and things like that. And, um, I taught some classes at pet stores to, uh, you know, to make money on the side like and that big box stores or local yeah, big box, like pet supply warehouse was one and those kinds of places that, that, that were in San Diego. I worked, uh, a friend had a boarding kennel and I would do part-time inboards for him and stuff like that. Um, at that point in time, but really no intentions of making it a profession. And, uh, I, got asked by a club that I used to work with that I had gone and trained with if I, they had a bunch of new members and they asked if I'd come in and kind of show the new members, the ropes and I did a little kind of clinic -y thing for them. And I did that and it went relatively well. And then here you are, somebody referred me to another club. And so I did one for another club. And at that point in time, I was contemplating grad school. My wife was, was, was too. And I'm, they start that started to pick up steam and I wasn't really like, setting out to make a career out of it, mm -hmm. but I kept getting asked to do seminars and the seminars kind of do it, started to expand. I'd worked with some police departments and next thing you know, I was doing seminars around the country full time. 
and I did that for 13 years. Uh, basically traveled full time, giving seminars to either dog training clubs, professional organizations like service dog organizations, police departments, you know, all that sort of thing. And near the end of that time, I just couldn't handle the traveling anymore. I was traveling between 40 and 45 weeks a year. Wow. I was doing 40 some seminars a year. And at that point, I'm like, what do I do? I can stop and start a dog training business, but I've spent the last 12 or 13 years coaching other dog trainers to be better dog trainers. And so of course you're mm. training dogs. And in that period of time, I took in and more dogs and gave people lessons and stuff. Well, when that was starting, but pretty much I was training trainers full time. So that was the impetus yeah. for me to open, open a school for trainers. And that was 10 years ago. So the school has been open for 10 years. Wow. And, and I think we just had our 1200, 1200 student go through. Wow. That's cool. Yeah. So it's been, yeah, that's been cool. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Cause I was, I was an accidental it, career. It, I, 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 you, I just yeah. plugged a lot. Yeah. Cause of, I was interested. How, how, yeah. That that's cool. Cause I was, cause I was going to ask you how you transitioned into, so you, <clears throat> you basically started off doing club seminars and clubs are usually a group of dog trainers or hobbyists or, but yeah, yeah. exactly. And yep. then you're like, well, I've been doing this for so long. I might as well just keep doing it. And, and you got a place and did that in Santa Rosa. And yeah, so originally, so when I opened the school, we were in the East Bay and we were just out uh, on the over near well, what would be, anybody recommend? We were in a little town called Fairfield, which was over on the east side of the bay near Berkeley and mm. that area. And then we were there for five years. And then uh, Carol and I bought a place in Sonoma. And so we started looking for it. And we moved, moved moved into the Santa Rosa place five years ago. Okay. And we bought an old school there. <clears throat> yeah, it's like, yeah. it's <laughs> perfect. It's perfect. It's like, it's so set up for, for what you guys do. And I remember when, when I was out there last time, we went out to, uh, we got lunch and stuff and, and then we went, uh, so are you, are you planning on expanding? Uh, I know that you, you were in discussion about potentially doing something like that. Are you, are you still, yeah, so we have lots of changes afoot. Uh, expanding, uh, is uh, yes, it's going to expand in that we're going to be able to serve more people. So I'm going to do less, um, kind of, of what I have been doing for the sure. last 10 years, which is basically stand in front of a class for seven hours a day yeah. and, and talk and train. Yeah. Uh, so that's getting broken up. We're going to do more hybrid live and online classes. Yeah. So people can take them remotely. I have Forrest is now working, working for me again, which is great. And I have a couple of other trainers that are very familiar with what we do. And so we're starting to kind of work on options where they're teaching more classes there. And um, a little more focus on our long-term students, and then more remote classes for the short-term students. Right. No, that makes sense. Yeah. That's cool. So I think we'll we'll wind up serving more students, but um, um, I won't be like teaching live as much as I have been. Right. Yeah. So, so you're kind of just stepping away from from you know stand, like you said the day-to-day -day operations of. Yeah. So th I mean for years i taught everything which meant you know basically our classes you you've been there you know what they're yeah. like class starts at 10 in the morning and we wind up at 4 30 or 5 in the evening yeah and it's a long day classes are typically one and two week long classes they're intensive type classes on specific subjects mm -hmm. outside we have a long-term program where students are with us for five months but most students come for a one week or two week long class but pretty typically those are those are full days of me teaching yeah. and then everything else that we were doing was happening outside of that. So if I did any video <laughs> projects or I did any online classes, uh, any of that stuff that was happening outside of that as well. So my schedule was pretty much chalk, you know, it was yeah. a lot, of, yeah. a lot of hours. <laughs> it's a lot. It's, <laughs> and a lo so it's a lot of work. I'm hit the spot where I want to slow down a little bit on that. Like last year I started training my own dogs and to competing again in a little bit and, so I've been jockeying the schedule to make that kind of stuff happen. So, um, and the, the, this pandemic and the forced yeah. Yeah. pause allowed me to push a whole bunch of energy into the online stuff that I've been talking about doing for years. I've been talking about it forever and just never get around to it. <laughs> yeah. so, this sort of kind of forced it to make it real. And I think it's going to help. We'll actually be able to reach more people. Yeah, for with, sure. With a little less time on my part. And yeah. 
um, record some of the lectures and yep. stuff like that, that people can listen to. And then my time can be used in a yep. kind of more targeted more targeted way. <clears throat> yeah, that's that's a smart idea. And that's something that I've always I'm trying to that's why I, I'm really big on uh, like, I'm getting into more of the um, like the zoom stuff and, and kind of doing like yeah. what you're talking about is just setting up a setting up more of like a scalable operation where you're filming maybe one of the classes with some of the students and then you're you're putting it out for purchase so people can sure. can do that. And it's more scalable. Yeah, absolutely. That's absolutely. cool. And ultimately, the the mission is to reach as many people as possible with good. Exactly. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Kind of elevated at the base level. And there are lots of people that can't afford or the time and the money to travel to the school. Like it's a big endeavor yeah. for people. So we yeah. certainly have lots of students that make it work, but it's that's it's a it's a big commitment. They yeah. Need time off. They need to find places to stay when they're there. And yeah. That sort of thing. And so um being able to offer more stuff to the general public and, and, you know, kind of just get good training information out there as much as possible. Yeah, no, that's, that's cool. I like that. That's a, that's a good idea. And, and it saves you too. So that way your quality, you know, over time and, and, and everybody's getting like what they want from you instead of, you know, you're basically just copy and pasting. That makes sense. That's cool. Um, yeah. <clears throat> cool. So that, so that's what you're doing right now. That's the operation. Uh, and that's your, that's your goal for the next uh, year or the next two years. And that's that, I think that'll work out good for you just because like you said, this kind of forced pandemic has made everybody, uh, adapt and say, okay, well now we're doing this. And if we were thinking about doing it now, we're definitely going to do it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, sure. So, couple a couple questions I have um, that I want to to discuss with you and get your get your opinion on it and I'm sure that you've covered these topics before um, moving forward with technology and, and, and the dog training industry um, <clears throat> what's your how do you feel so for me um, like I said before I, I got into I talk about remote collar training or e-collar training mm -hmm. I I got into it very organically I, I basically my Saint Bernard which is over here he's one of my pets. Um, he played chicken with a train one day and I, it was just a really tough thing. I, I basically had to make the decision to either run and risk my own life to get him off or watch him, you know, get hit by the train really dark. But anyway, it taught me a big lesson, moved me towards how can I train my dog off leash? And I literally, uh, um, uh, asked my friend Janine and she's been doing e-collar training. And so I got into it. Um, and then, like I said before, I wasn't until I started, asking my clients if they were interested into remote collar training that I found the political side to, you know, I, I think the, I think it's it, ignorance probably is a good, is a good way to put it. Um, so the e-collar ban is happening in, in more countries now than, than before. Mm -hmm. Um, what is, I'm just interested in, in your standpoint because of how, how involved you are in the dog training world and how much you've been doing it and how much knowledge you have in it. And, um, <clears throat> I just want to give you my standpoint on it just really quick. And then I, and then you can reflect on what, it, what I have to say. Cause I think like for me, I've changed my opinion so many different times where mm -hmm. before I was like, so mad about it. I'm like, this is this is just crazy. I just don't understand, you know? But then I started kind of thinking, I said, well, well, maybe it might be better in some places because people really don't have the tools, knowledge, or accessibility to use. Maybe when I and I started taking a step back, and I think that that's part of being a dog trainer is constantly evolving and shifting. <clears throat> um, so anyway, so I'm kind of like in limbo. I'm like maybe some places are better off without them, and then other places aren't. What's your? Can you can you give me your opinion on on that? Yeah, I I, I think. I think it's a it's an incredibly valuable tool if it's used correctly, and the it, the the reason that we see tool bans in general uh, is um, because twofold: one, people don't understand their use and they don't understand good dog training, and um, there is a psychological um, aversion to the use of electronics and a, 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 as a term form of punishment. People just think of getting shocked. People are very, I think on an atavistic level, very um, sensitive to that. Like mm -hmm. people you ever touch something and shock you, people get really edgy about that. They find it very um, uh, psychologically 
scary in the sense a yeah. little bit. And so they're projecting that they don't kind of, they don't know what the stimulation feels like. They don't all that stuff. So if you're talking to people that don't know anything about the tool, then you say shock collar, you say these things and people have ideas about people shocking dogs. And, mm -hmm. and th so there's a psychological aspect that allow people to go, that tool seems like it shouldn't be used. Right. And people don't understand its use either. And there's a long history of people using it poorly. Right. right. So you can go out there and people can drop <laughs> videos of people using right. the tool absolutely poorly. And that tool, because people are a little bit resistant to its use in general, because people are like, oh, I don't want to shock my dog right. or anything, then people only want to bust it out when there's a problem. Exactly. They look at it like it's the largest stick. You exactly. know, okay, we've exhausted all other possibilities. Now it's time for the e collar, which is absolutely the wrong way to approach its use. Yes. Right? Yeah. It's not going <clears> to <throat> fix a problem of communication. It's not going to fix a problem of timing. It's not going to, none of the rest of these things. It's a tool like any other, and it's subject to all the same laws. And so for me, I'm obviously a huge proponent of educating everyone on all the possible aspects of dog training and all the possible aspects of all the various tools that we might use and the good things about them and the things you need to watch out for. And that takes time. It takes energy. It takes people committing to that process. Mm -hmm. And, and so I think, um, because the tool has, is easy to abuse if you're not paying attention, right. um, then it lends energy to the people that want to ban it, that people yeah. out there are people out there that, I mean, we all know the, the, the divide in the dog training world, mm -hmm. which, you know, a huge part of what I'm trying to do is get those groups to talk to each other and understand each other. But I think a lot of that is from a lack of experience or the wrong kind of experience with the tool. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think anybody that's seen them used properly and appropriately recognizes their value yeah. uh, that, that many dogs <clears throat> might be improved. And so for me, all those things come together and it's all about education. All, the whole thing's about education. Yeah. And should the tools, uh, any of the tools for dog training, um, uh, be used in a knee jerk fashion. No, none of them should, right. There should be a thoughtful plan for all of that. And, and so I get the idea that you would want mm -hmm. people to, you know, have to demonstrate some kind of like they are in certain places where they're wanting the idea that you would, you know, license people to, right. to feed that's them or teach things like that's it's, it's a, it's a hard world to navigate, but I think I, I get the impulse for yeah. that. I understand. Yeah. I have that sometimes like don't use this until you understand timing and yeah. you should be able to demonstrate certain proficiency. The problem is that that's hard to apply in a large way. So I think our job is not to kind of vilify any of the tools. It's to get out there and yeah. educate people about their proper use. And they do get used in the wrong situations and they get used the right way a lot too. By yeah. The, no way. So. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's good what you said in the beginning. I, I recently had a post that I, that I did, um, because a lot of my clients are, are really, um, what I often find dog owners do uh, is they say, I don't want to have to use the e-collar. And for me, I'm like, that's like saying like, I don't want to have to like break out this really nice bottle of wine, but I will, if I have to, it's like, really <laughs> like that, you know? So for me, I, I've I, exactly, like you said, like it's, it's, it's something that people like don't want to reach for necessarily. And for me, I'm, I'm doing the best I can to wrap my head. I think being, I think I'm, trying to, and again, I'm trying to be devil's advocate, glass half full, um, being super empathetic to the ignorance that is there. Cause I think that, like you said, I think that that's what it's all about is people just having no idea of what it is now versus what it was and how it's being used in the variations of stimulation yeah. and, and levels. I like, but, go ahead. And I think for me that part of the, the, the thing you have to worry about, like, so the, there are people that don't want to use all our because of the way they think about it. They don't want to use a remote collar because of the way they think about it. Like, ooh, that's mean to my dog kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And that's not that that's the wrong way to think about it, certainly. And like, and that's certainly not the case if it's used properly. Yeah. Um, not that there aren't places where you're using it in a way that's unpleasant for the dog, for sure. There are situations in which that is necessary. There are emergency situations and things in which that's necessary. But the idea that um it's somehow bad that the dog yeah. mean to the dog, right? That that's a misconception. The, if it's used properly, what I see on the other end, like when people, people get dog trainers get really enamored with it too. Yeah. And, 
So you want to use it for everything, even things that you wouldn't technically have to use the collar for, right? That yeah, are I've been there. That are good. And when people get that enamored with that tool, you can become reliant on it. And it is a piece of technology, right? And yep. so if it's not applied properly, not only yep. could you can make a dog that's not responsive without the collar really easily. Yep. And then if the collar doesn't work, you have one that malfunctions or in your, mm -hmm. your, your dog's run over by the train anyway, right? Yeah, exactly. So there's ways to use it properly. And if you want to have your dog be responsive without the collar too, it's a more involved, longer training process yeah. to do correctly to make sure that the tool's there to reinforce your training, but the dog doesn't become reliant on that tool. Right. So there, there are things that people need to navigate, I think, that's important. Yeah. And, but I think you're, you're spot on. The people that are like, I don't want to have to use yeah. the collar that where meaning they don't want to, they, they think they're being mean to the dog and they don't want to have to be mean to their yeah. dog, which is a misconception. Yeah. So. And, and I, and I've just been, and I'm guilty of, of, if a lot of that, because I'm just so <clears throat> like enthusiastically passionate about like, I'm over the top sometimes, you know, and, expect, and, and using my platform on, on social media, um, you know, on YouTube, you know, same thing with you. If, if you watch the video of training that you did today, five years ago, six years ago, you'd be, you know, my, my, my process has changed a little bit, but anyway, so I used to, I used to just be so, like you said, enamored with just like people, like you can use it for all these different things. Uh, and like that, you get caught up where you're like somebody like myself, a, a, a new, a newer balanced dog trainer 10 years ago, I was just like the e-collar you can use for everything. Like, let's just, just trust me. And I was so, I was so trying to get people over the fact of how, how it doesn't shock your dog. You know, I, I just try to use it for every application that I, that I could be, that I th thought in my head as creatively as I could of, you know, you using it as a, a marker and using it as an association and, and, and just, just, I'm, I'm trying to get creative and, and turn the wheel a different way and just, and try to, and mainly it was mainly because I was so frustrated with, dog owners, um, shine away from it. It was very, it, it hurt. It almost hurt my feelings. I was like, sure. I want you to understand so bad that I'll, I'll, you know, do, do a circus to try to get you over that, over that line. Um, <clears throat> which leads me to like another conversation too, is, is how, how do you, how do you approach situations? And I'm sure being on the level that you're at in, in the seminars and the, in the, the crowds that you draw, if it's 10 or a hundred, how how do you deal with somebody who just won't accept new information because of a because of an opinion on a you know a one dimensional um, thought process? Um, I, I I know it's a layered to, question, but no, no. So I what I my goal is to present the information that I know from my personal experience and from science to the best of my ability, mm -hmm. and then respect people's ability to make their own decisions about that. And their dogs got trained. Uh, for many years without electronic collars, for many years without treats, yeah. for many years. So there are methods out there and approaches out there. I think there are benefits in certain circumstances that, that where the e-collar works better and is the kinder option in certain cases. Yeah. But there are other, but there are other approaches. And so if somebody is really resistant, I, it's not on me to judge their yeah. their stance on it and as long as i've done my best to give them what i consider to be the best available information uh, at that point i do my job there and then if they're still resistant my next job is to try to supply them with alternatives mm -hmm. yeah and so that are, then I was like, if, if emotionally or whatever reason for whatever you're you're at the stand the point where you take the stance you are and you don't want to use that tool cool then that's all fine. right yeah I, i've given you what i why i think it's it's the right tool for this situation or it might help in this situation and i give you the best science i can give you and now okay here's some alternatives mm -hmm. here's the other ways i know of thinking about approaching that problem yeah but i think now like in dog training, people have a tendency to specialize, right? So yeah. the reward-based clicker trainers are really in their niche and the e-collar trainers getting in their niche. And, and so it's easy to kind of disregard other branches of the training world. And I would encourage anybody that, that has an interest in training and certainly anybody that's doing this professionally to get out there and, and dip your toes in all those waters because then you'll have solutions for those people because you're going to run into people that you won't be able to help if, yeah. if they won't use tool and sure. maybe you can uh, use one of the alternatives. So that's kind of how I approach it. Anyway. 
Yeah. Yeah. No, that's good. Uh, uh, yeah, that's good. That makes sense. Have you ever had anybody go go through your school that tried to just because you said twelve hundred students, right? Is that what you said? Yeah, twelve hundred individual students. Yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> have you ever have you ever had anybody uh, go through your school trying to just just push against what you're doing? I'm just curious if you've ever had anybody. Uh, okay, uh-uh. I've had lots of people like that at seminars. Yeah, like I did when I did seminars because go do one and two and three day seminars all over the place, and so you all you'd get a really resistant person at a seminar. But pretty typically, if somebody comes to the school, they've done their research. They yeah. they like they like the way we think about dog training, and yeah. that's you don't just casually pop into the school. It's not like oh hey, yeah, I just yeah, thought yeah. I'd pop in on your class, right? Yeah. They're they're a pretty good big commitment for people in terms of time and energy, and so they've usually done their research. So not really, there are people there that like it turned out to be different than they thought and things like that, but they're yeah. no even strongly resistant. But I, we used to get those kinds of people at seminars all the time in the back of their arms crossed. Like, yeah. Oh, this is bullshit. I, in the early stages of my training, uh, giving seminars and things like that, that I was, a little, that would make me a little uncomfortable. It'd rattle me a little bit. I still did my thing, but it would rattle me a little bit as I got along. I, I loved those people. Like yeah. I looked at them as a challenge. Uh, you're a teacher ultimately. Like if you're, if you're helping people with dog training, you're a teacher. Right. And, mm-hmm. and so I like, how do I reach this person? Yeah. Because, Cause I know, uh, the information I have to give them is, is useful for them and they don't have to take it all, but there's stuff in here that's going to help them and it's going to be useful to them. And I just have to get them in the place they mm-hmm. can receive it for me. And so I always looked at those people as, as, uh, yeah. as a little bit of a challenge. Challenge. I, yeah. It's a seminar about talking to that person. And yeah. It, 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 in a not overt way, but yeah, I've done yeah. that. I've done that before too. If I if <laughs> if I feel uh, well, you you'll get the husband like not yeah. at not at seminars, but like you know in yeah. private training where they're like, yeah, for sure, no, and and, <laughs> yeah. and then I'm 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 talking to him as I'm talking to her. Yeah, exactly right. And it's yeah. it's so and, and and again, it's just like you know as as dog trainers, I think that there's a there's a level of passion for the animal. I think that that's where it starts, and then it kind of builds on top of that as far as a career and different paths. But um, it's tough because you care so much, and you know in the back of your head that what you're trying to apply or the 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 things that you're trying to do with the dog ultimately, I mean, is going to to benefit the dog, and the, the individual that hired you is also arguing with you. It becomes kind of kind of tricky. Yeah. 100%. And you have to and you have to be patient with people because yeah. you've spent a significant amount of time developing an expertise and working at this, right? Yeah. And uh, that doesn't happen overnight. Like you weren't able to process and certain ideas at a certain point either. Like mm-hmm. when you're talking about you're 19 and you're dog walking, right. your instincts, you're feeling things, you're starting to know some things, but what you don't know far outweighs what you know, right? Yeah. And so I always look to newbies that same way like there are people there that are going to be resistant because it doesn't jive with the rest of their experience yeah so i have to be patient with them while i bring them along yeah and what they need to know to accept this idea may be built on a whole bunch of other building blocks that they haven't been supplied yet yeah so sometimes you have to go way back to basic basic learning theory stuff and, and that kind of thing in an attempt to get them to the point where they can receive what they need yeah. to receive at the moment right well, I think what you said in the beginning was good about, uh, and I and I'm still I'm still in that level. I'm at that level where I'm getting information that I know is good, but I don't know where to stick it. I'm like, you know, some, talking to like somebody like Forrest, where there's a lot of this stuff going on with obedience, and I'm like, uh, if there's a, you know, because I'm more of a behavior mod guy. I'm like, if there's a problem, I that's what gives me goosebumps. That's what I'm like, let me in. Like the dog's trying to kill people, let me in. <laughs> And then, right. you know, but getting the information about, you know, competitive obedience and, and, you know, different rings. Sp- I love, I love everything with dogs and I like intaking it, but I don't know where to compartmentalize it. I'm like, yeah. this is important, but I don't know where to put it. And I think that that was a really good way to, to look at it. And I think that that's, that's true because that happens. you you take that information in, you don't really know where to put it. Um, but so Michael, like you take in, you know, 1200, 12, 1200 dog trainers, um, where do you think taking a step back and like overall looking at the bigger picture of the dog training industry, where do you think it's going? Cause I think in the last, I don't know, it just, and it's hard for me to say, cause I've, I've, I haven't been in it long enough to take a 
big look back and see the development of where it's come from where it's at. But it seems to me that it's becoming because of, I think, a couple different things, social media, um, creating an Instagram account and just um, Fido's doggy boot camp professional dog trainer behavioralist. Boom. Um, there I am, you know, ordering business cards and, um, you know, it is what it is. Um, but anyway, so it kind of just seems with, with social media and people having a love, uh, mm-hmm. because they love dogs, uh, and, yep. and businesses being created. And there's a time and a place for that. I think, you know, on a, on a very micro level of doing basic obedience, I think it's pretty much harmless for the most part. But what I'm, what I'm more like, I want your opinion on taking a step back and seeing the development of dog training and where do you think it's, where do you think it's headed? Yeah. So that brings up a whole bunch of interesting thoughts and questions in there. So one, I think that the trends in dog training mirror the trends in society at large, right? Mm. So you see yeah. the ideas about dog training began to evolve as ideas about child rearing did as well. You know, uh, some of the, the reward based revolution that began to take place in the 80s, right, is when it really started to take off. And later 80s, especially and into the early 90s is when things started to hit. Before that, people weren't doing rewards and dog training to speak of. And, and so that was also mirroring a time in society where talk, people are talking about, hey, don't spank your kids and, mm. you know, psychology, oh, okay. different ways of thinking about behavior and all that kind of stuff, right? And so I think that a lot of the trends and ideas there follow along. And so people get really enamored with one idea. They take it kind of to its logical extreme. Mm. And then they realize, ooh, you know, some things that we were doing before were better than these. And it starts to find its way back, right? And and it has little swings like that. And I think it'll continue to chase those things as people try to find the best combination of all the new information that we get to do the best job for the dogs. And so it's always kind of adjusting a little bit based on, on kind of society's ideas because ultimately um it should be about what's best for the dog in front of you right right but it's also not just that simple for people that are doing it professionally they have to be able to get somebody else on board right they have to mm-hmm. be able to get on board for their protocols and that means selling it to them in some fashion even if you I like i don't like to call it but you have to convince them that what you're talking about is the right way to do it right and so the trends in society the way people look at those things affect people's ability to do that so i think that it's swinging around and it's trying to find its equilibrium. I think we were, we were way too aversive at one point. Now we've Ah. went the other direction too much. And now there were trying people, lots of people out there trying to find the right balance and the balance is a different place for different dogs. And so there isn't a sweet spot is what sweet spot for one dog isn't for the other and all that kind of stuff that we know. Um, Social media and the internet Uh, is a double-edged sword, right? So it allows the free exchange of ideas in a really easy way. Information is available to people that certainly wasn't when I started dog training. Right. If you were to learn it, you could go get books, you would go to the library and that kind of stuff, but you were not getting the same kind of information. You can just go on the computer and see video examples of all kinds of stuff, right? So the amount of information that's accessible to more people in the industry and to the layperson is astronomically higher. But the double-edged sword part is they have to wade through what's good and bad because mm-hmm. there's so much crap out there. Like that's, mm-hmm. and there's so many that uh, you alluded to it, instant experts. All somebody can do is if they are yeah. good, if they're good social media influencers, they can take some nice pictures and videos and, yeah. and you know, they can be giving lots of people advice when they may not, really have mm-hmm. the experience giving good advice and people have to kind of wade through the people that really kind of know what they're doing and know what they're talking about and don't. And that gets harder you, uh, uh, when you don't have the same kind of personal access to people, right? Mm-hmm. This, you see what they want you to see. Yeah. When I started, you went out and you saw people in person working with their dogs. Yeah. And you, and after a few rounds, I could tell whether somebody knew what they were doing or not because I could watch them with their dogs. Yep. If it's over the internet, somebody can take the perfect clips and throw yep. them on here and you don't know what they know and you don't know what happens when they're not doing it. So there are parts about it that I think are great and parts about it that are a little bit of a problem. Also, without going too far down the rabbit hole, I think we live in a, a society where um, instant gratification is a huge part of what we do. People want what they want now. They want to get, I want to yeah. be 
professional trainer tomorrow. And it takes years, years and years to get really good at anything. Mm -hmm. to become an It doesn't matter what it is. Yeah. You want to be a plumber? You can go to plumbing school. Are you an expert plumber when you get out of plumbing school? Hell no. Right. 20 years down the road. Now you're an expert plumber. You know, every little problem, you know, the, you've seen it all yeah. right at that point. And that's when you're expert. And no matter what, there is no substitute for that. But there is, there feels like there's a lot of trainers out there that are in too big a hurry. Like enjoy the process. Like it's dog training is fascinating. It's you'll yeah. never be bored. Endlessly interesting. And enjoy the growth. Let it happen the way it's supposed to happen. You, like you can have ideas and you can understand. So I can explain something to you mm -hmm. and that makes sense to you. And you can turn around and tell somebody else the same thing, but that doesn't mean you've done it 50 times and you know in your body what it's like, right? Mm -hmm. That comes just with life experience. And so I think just kind of coaching people into like, take it a step at a time. It's going to take you a while to get very good at this. Yeah. And don't put the car before the horse a little bit. I'm telling students all the time, like, hey, don't worry as much about your your business cards and the van right. wrap and stuff right now. <laughs> like, figure out what you're doing. That stuff will take care of itself. I don't know a single dog trainer that ha that's good at what they do that doesn't have more business than they can stand. Right. They can't keep up with it if, if, they're, if they're truly qualified. But everybody's looking at way, angles to sell what they're doing in yeah. the beginning. Yeah. Slow down on that. Get good at what you're doing, and then the other parts will take care of itself. But anyway, that's a that's Yeah, no, off, no, no. That's it. Off, off my soapbox. I think. No, no, no. It's good. It's good. I love that. And that's you know, that's the beauty of the of the podcast. It's 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 very informal and, and I love that. And that's true. And and um and, and I and I get that question often, very often, and we'll talk about that in a minute of um how to build um how to how to I remember I did this seminar in, in uh LA um, and I, I actually, it was, I did it for free. I did it for, um, I did it for a, sh uh, uh, raising money basically, uh, for shelter yeah. dogs. And yeah. yeah. And so, um, I remember this one guy came up to me and he said, Hey man, uh, how do you, how do you get to travel? How do you, and I had a, I had a video guy with me to record my, my sessions and, you know, to, 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 to put it out. And, um, and I said, I, I said I don't I don't understand the I don't understand the question. He's like, well, how do you get to a point where your people are are flying you places and and you can go places and people will attend and know who you are? And and I was just kind of taken back. I'm like that you can't pay for that. I said, and and I started kind of thinking about it. I'm like, people, I think people think that there's this secret that all of a sudden you just hit the right key on the right board and poof, you're like, and and I and it kind of made me put things into perspective that I think that that's what it comes down to is, is dog training. And actually you and I had this conversation, um, at the, uh, the Mexican place across the street. Mm -hmm. Um, we had a conversation about, uh, we were, I was talking about, um, because I'm sure you, you get this too. And we, we, we had this conversation about production companies and TV and the amount yeah. of, the amount of inquiries I get of like, Hey, we want you to be involved in this next big hit TV show. And you're like, we had this conversation about actually yep. dog training yeah. is actually pretty damn boring if, if it's good. Um, it's and you got to, right. exactly. And <laughs> like you got, slow TV. <laughs> yeah, I remember we had this conversation cause you, you, you had a friend, um, that was in TV and you're like, really? And they asked you to do it and you're like, it's not, it's really not as, as glamorous. So anyway, so, that that's something that kind of clicked with me that um going back to social media and things like that that it you got the proof is in the pudding you have to and for me like uh, there's there's i i started putting content out on on youtube um because i wanted two things i i thought that some of the basic stuff that I was teaching people how to put collars on right, um, so on and so forth, uh, little tiny stuff, micro stuff could help sure. people. The macro for me at the time and still is, but now it's it's being overtaken, is I wanted feedback because – I, I, I wanted I wanted to work with other people. I wanted to get information out for feedback and mirror and I didn't and I was I, I, I didn't I didn't know um, anything about YouTube and how it was gonna grow to where it's at now. Sure, um, yeah. But anyway, so so anyway, so it was just like one of those things that I think 
having, like you said, like going out and you just have to put the, put the time in. And for me, now that I deal with like really, like, so when I, when I do a title on, on, on YouTube, here's what I do is if I have a dog that comes in, that's barking at me, habitually barking, showing teeth, uh, showing teeth as they bark, but not showing teeth separately. Um, I'll say aggressive blank. Uh, so German shepherd, pit bull, whatever, um, blah, blah, blah. And the reason I do that, and I get shit for it sometimes because people are like, that dog's not aggressive. I'm like, I, I know that. But the people who are who don't know dogs who are searching because they have the same issues are saying my dog's aggressive when it's a very fear-based, um, genetical, uh, not confident, very vocalization roar, 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 type barking. And, and, and so anyway, so there, there's, there's just an interesting chemistry that, that happens when you, you put stuff out on the, the interweb. Um, but what I started doing is I started, t I started doing almost live sessions where dogs would come in. Um, some of them very rarely were they actually aggressive. Very rarely do they actually back up what they mean yeah. and, 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 and display and normally relatively uncommon. <laughs> yes, exactly. The, and in, in my opinion, in my um, experience, the dogs who were serious never were vocal. They just went in. They were like, I'm, yeah. I, I want a piece of you or the yeah. other dog. And if they were, if really, truly aggressive dogs were that common, then we'd have a lot more dog legislation. We wouldn't have people, right. a lot more people wouldn't have dogs. So, yes. Right? Like yeah. the, the truth of the matter is, if you figure like half the households in the country have dogs. And yes. So yes. If, if they were, if there was a, 10% of them were really actually truly seriously aggressive. Yeah, like, not exactly. Not have dogs anymore. Exactly. <laughs> no, it's a good, it's a good point. And, and so anyway, so going back to what that guy was saying in LA is I just said, man, you got, you, you got to just put, put yourself out there. I mean, if you're, like you said, if, if, if you believe in what you're doing is purposeful and meaningful, could help an individual on the other side of the world that's desperate and needs help, and they can watch a video of you putting on, you know, instead of getting a 3.2 prong collar hanging down to their neck, getting a 2.25 that sits properly can change their life on a walk, then put that content out as long as you're confident with it. And so anyway, I guess I was just getting into a lot of people are in that instant gratification of I want to be this, I want to be that. And it's like, then put yourself out there. There's not many, if you look at dog training um, in scenario based situations, there's more, there's way, 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 way more talented dog trainers out there than I think people realize. However, there's, yeah. there's not a lot of people who are good teachers and are able to teach humans how to take that information in and make it digestible and understandable. I tell that to people all the time that email me and they say, I want to get into dog training, but, uh, I, and I always tell them like, there's a lot of people who are really great with animals, but there's you have to be able to do a little bit of both of being a good teacher. Oh, a hundred percent, you do. Like that's a people are a lot of people are attracted to dog training because they uh, they're uncomfortable with people. They're yeah, so anxious and yeah, that's a good point. They don't, they don't like dealing with people and like the dogs. Like I, they can yeah. have these real relationships without yeah. being judged and see. So there are lots of people that are drawn to this. Unfortunately, if you're going to make a living at it. There are very few options for yeah. people to make a living where you just work with the dogs and you don't have to deal with the people <laughs> on the other hundred percent. So, and it's and you will realize very quickly that your success is yes. driven by how well you reach the person yes. on the other end of the leash. You're, yes, like, and people like it, like those people like inboards, but it doesn't matter. You take a dog in, you can do the best job in the world. Yeah, if you can't communicate to those people when it goes back, and you can't get them on board, and you can't get them enthusiastic about working with the dog, it's going to go away. Yeah, like, there's no magic bullet It's not going to last yeah. you don't have the dog for six weeks. And then there you go. Or yeah, <laughs> yeah, that transfer, that transfer, yeah, that transfer. It's, it's all about your human interaction. It's huge. And and I, and I say that all the time to to my my staff. Uh, I say, you know, we're really not in the dog business, guys, we're in the people business. And and like I said, if you can be a better communicator and kind of a less more, less talented dog trainer and have more success because of your ability to communicate to, to individuals and to people. And I think a lot of people struggle with that, that conversion. I would call it a conversion. I don't know. It just popped in my head that people need to be able to convert that to the owners and, and educate. And, and, and of so, course, it, it depends on your your niche too exactly like finding their things so like obviously if you're training police dogs and things like that then yeah. at a certain 
this point you have to have a certain level of skill like mm -hmm. otherwise your product is not gonna not yeah. gonna get you and you're gonna be out of business right yeah so pet dog training uh lots of people that are not doing super great training can still make a living because they're dealing with people that don't know what they're doing mm -hmm. right it's better than and, nothing and, 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 yeah, and, 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 so you look like a genius because the people you're talking to don't know anything about dogs. Mm -hmm. So there's there's these gradients as you move up through the 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 different levels of training where things get more involved and the yeah. actual skill of a trainer. You don't have to be a super skilled trainer to if you have good if you're a good teacher to help somebody with their dog. Right. So you don't have to be a high, high level sport trainer, high level obedience trainer. You don't have to train tracking dogs. You don't have to, very complex, difficult dog training behaviors don't need to be on your plate. Mm -hmm. If you are good with people and you get them on board, you know, the basics, then you can help somebody with their dog. Right. Yep. 100%. And, uh, and, and so kind of knowing your niche too. Uh, yeah. That's, critical. that's what I was going to, I was going to get into. Um, and I know that we're, uh, you know, I know that we're about an hour, so I want to, I want to cover just a couple more things with you. Um, okay. it's a great, great point that you were talking about. And that's what I recently started getting into as, as, I, as I'm evolving and, and people are asking me for advice on, on their career, which I, I feel a little, um, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about it. Cause like I said, like you, you just got to do it. Just if, if, if you feel like just put it out there, I mean, just, just do it. I mean, if you're doing a good job, then, and a lot of people just aren't, um, you know, um, not necessarily on the internet, just in general, like showing people and, and whatever. But I tell people to find your, because the dog training, uh, industry is such a big bubble. And mm -hmm. two things that I talk about a lot about, um, primarily with my, um, my clients, my pet clients, because that's all I really do, um, is dog training is such a big bubble. And what happens most oftentimes, unfortunately for the dog, is when you bring your dog to a dog trainer and they're just um, a, a dog training company, say a franchise or something like that. Uh, and yeah, they do dog training, but you they don't do a certain type of dog training. So if you need a behavior modification or if you're working with a dog that is just way out of your comfort zone. And I think oftentimes too, the the comfort zone gets mixed up with um, levels of ability or, or importance. Yeah. I think people think if they do basic right. obedience or they do puppy uh, foundational training that it's not as cool or not as, not as, not as good mm -hmm. as, as, behavior modification and i'm like what are you talking about that's this it's you're you're it's two different things it's you know pasta it's over potatoes man you can exactly yeah, it's, a, it's the important part like if if more people were good at that yeah the behavior mod people would be out of work exactly right? <laughs> exactly like, so if, if if you could get good basic training information to people from the beginning yeah the puppy the dog starting yeah. out and understand behavior and under all that stuff and it was getting mass consumed we would have way fewer behavior problems right the stuff that winds up as emergency behavior mod problems are because somebody missed the boat mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. if, if we talk you know there's a difference between raising a dog to prevent a problem and then dealing with a problem that's established in an older dog they're very different yeah. sets of skills right so and it no so it's that, totally valuable for sure yeah it's 100 yeah. percent. so for for a new dog trainer um or somebody who and and i and i feel like the market like we we've, we've talked about uh, it just it's very saturated and i think that the the turnover or the transfer from people loving dogs i think there's a significant difference between a dog as you probably know as well and you talk about is a dog lover and a professional are like two like two different things yeah. um so what what advice would you give and i'm um, you know, and, and, and this is something that like, you know, my listeners are going to benefit the most from what advice would you give for somebody who is either looking to get into dog training or they're novice, um, five years or less, and they're trying to find their way of, um, what they want to do. What, what advice would you give that person? Um, so one, and you have to learn if you don't to enjoy the the day-to-day -day process mm -hmm. dog training is a process driven thing and good dog training is small incremental undramatic change right ultimately it happens because boring. you show up every day and it's boring right yeah. well it's I, it's I it's not boring there's lots of things that in there that are beautiful yeah there are little things that happen 
over time when you show up and you're consistent and you really learn how the process works, right? But you have to enjoy that day to day. Like if you're all about the end result, like then you're going to be unhappy as a dog trainer because you spend a small amount of time there at the goal spot where, oh, okay, this dog's finished. It's good. And you spend a lot of time in process. And so the day to day aspects of that, you have to like that, right? You have to like showing up. You have to like the going through things in small steps. You have to like repetition, right? It's all about repetition and consistency and communication. So you learn to like that part of it. Learn what it really is to do good dog training. So obviously learn your craft, right? And don't be in a hurry in the initial stages to get your business up and running. Like take your time with that. Like businesses built fast are usually built mm. on an inadequate foundation. Mm -hmm. And people are going to see through that and you're going to alienate people because you're going to wind up having taking on clients and situations that you probably shouldn't mm -hmm. you move faster than you should have. So if you, and if you enjoy the process, then it doesn't matter that it takes you longer to get there. And a business that's built slowly on experience and knowledge and somebody that really enjoys the day to day aspects of handling a dog and teaching people and watching people make breakthroughs with their dogs, you'll have a lasting business and you can make a really good living at dog training like you really can but if you try to blast through that do that quickly and if you overly romanticize what dog training is on its mm. base level yes you're spending a lot of times with dogs but it's it's the grind of animal husbandry that is taking care mm -hmm. of them every day doing that thing and so one i would say expose yourself to as many good trainers as you possibly can join clubs do any of that kind of stuff where you can put yourself around other trainers you pick up a little stuff along the way these days, there's more educational material than ever available to people. Avail yourself of that. Get out there. Try that stuff. And then do it. Like you said, you got to get out there and do it every day. Like, you got to put your hands on dogs. Borrow your friend's dogs while you're trying to get to it. Like, hey, let me. Like, dog walking is a great way of getting into dog training. I know many dog trainers that came into it that way. That's your chance to put your hands on lots of dogs. Yeah. And so while you're learning your craft, you're going to need to find ways to be able to handle a lot of different dogs because uh, you training one dog, you, you got a dog, you did a good job. You're not a dog trainer yet. Like you right. did a good job, one dog. That doesn't mean you, you know the nuances and your next dog could be really different. And so as much as that process is possible, commit yourself to the journey of that. And if you like the journey, the day to day part, then you'll like dog training. Mm hmm one of those people that want to solve problems be done tomorrow and yeah. do things fast and look for quick fixes and that you're not going to enjoy yeah. dog training as a career. It's not, it's not for you. And, and let your build, you had mentioned the term multiple times and you started this idea of kind of an organic move yeah. through the process, get into it, experience it, try as many dogs as you can expose yourself to as many different aspects of training as you possibly can yeah. and something will start to speak to you. You'll find your groove like, Hey, this really appeals to me. And some of the things that appeal to people, it takes longer to develop a reputation and get there, but you're doing something that you, re that really appeals to you, which makes it easier to put in the day to day time. If you're like, I, you know, I really don't like working with this kind of dog, but I should, because it's my job you're not going to put in the time because you don't you like going to work every day isn't fun at that point. So you, there's some aspect of, of that, that you have to enjoy uh, the day to day. And so find the part of dog training that appeals to you. Like I have a woman that, that um, took a lot of classes and she loves the puppy stuff, right? She loves early foundation work like crazy. And every do good dog trainer would love to have a business where they like, got people from the beginning and from the ground up, but she has realized that about herself. She said like, this is what I'm best at. This is what I right. really like. And so it took her five years to get her business to the point where she, she had a second job. She was doing other stuff. It took her five years to get to the point where she had a business that was supporting her that was doing just that. But she, she did, she got really good at her niche and she had all these different creative classes for puppies. Cause that was the yeah. sweet spot. Right. And it takes time to develop that. And so don't be in too big of a hurry. Right? Yeah, no, that's, that's great information. And then one thing, one thing too, for the, for the listeners. And, uh, if we end up putting this, um, uh, up on video form too, is one very underestimated, very easy thing to get into, to learn about dogs is doggy daycares. 
That's how I, that was my second step. I did dog walking and then I got into doggy daycares and I have a doggy daycare and, um, I just did a video on it, uh, yesterday and, and I tell people like, if you really want to know dogs and you really want to watch them interact with each other and learn from each other and how they communicate, go spend a half you know, for me, it was like a couple of years just with different dogs in, in and out, uh, different pack dynamics on different days, just putting your hands on that many dogs and, and really watching them and studying them. I did a lot of stuff with wolves too in Colorado. I did a lot of stuff with them watching and studying and interacting with them. And that's one thing that people can do. And I tell people all the time, like find a local daycare and, 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 do it, do it for free. Just say, Hey, I just, I'm trying to learn. Um, it, it, you know, you don't even have to get paid. Just say, do you mind if I come in and do some part-time hours? Uh, you don't have to pay me. I just would like to, you know, yeah. uh, cause the most of, most of doggy day, again, like what we talk about the glamour of, of the dog industry, most of doggy daycare is picking up poop, making sure dogs don't hump each other and fight. That's it. That's yeah. it. It's really just se- <laughs> separating. And, but if, if you watch and you learn, it's a great way for seven hours a day and just watching dogs when they get tired, when they get mad, when they get possessive, when they get jealous, when they get, um, all of that. And it's, yeah, it's absolutely. great. That's, yeah, that's absolutely. the other thing. How do you feel yeah. about, how do you feel about, um, dog training certifications like online and the many yeah, levels I mean, of those? I understand them. Like I understand the, the goal for that. And mostly their value is f- as a marketing tool for the most part, so that you can tell people that you've been through some process. Yeah. It's a little like going to college or going to school. It's the same thing. It basically says you 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 jump some minimum level of hurdles. And so if somebody's trying to weed through trainers, mm-hmm. you can say, hey, look, I, I, I've educated myself in some way, which might make someone that's sitting the fence about you uh, decide to hire you in that case. Yeah. But of course, the, like, they all have their own kind of agendas. And so I wouldn't want to tie myself to one specifically. Right. Mm -hmm. Meaning I wouldn't want to say, oh, APDT or whatever their certifications are. I'm just tossing them out. They have an idea of what good dog training is. And so you're going to learn their part of it. Right. And they're going to say you've done the minimum level. Yeah. It's a little like titling dogs. And so it's a it's a good stepping off point. Doesn't hurt you in any way. But don't box yourself in either. Yeah. I mean, expose yourself to other methodologies and other other training ideas uh, get out there and then for the people that are looking for trainers don't just look at it, the certification and say that 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 says anything about the person's right. ability because there are lots of people that get certifications lots. that go through schools and do, and do those sorts of things that yeah yeah not good at what they're doing in any way so it's just a base level of things for people and for from a dog trainer's perspective yeah i think probably most people should go through some certification because it'll help you a little bit definitely be, uh, to, to say you're, you're doing your continuing yeah. education. Yeah. I, I get a lot of, uh, I'm one of the, uh, um, ABC, um, mentors, mm-hmm. which is cool yeah. because I, I have an opportunity to actually ha- help people get their hands on dogs where they're like, you know, I'm like, you can't go and flip through your book once a dog starts to try to, you know, bite you or whatever. I said, you gotta, so, but, but you're right. I do deal with some people that are just like looking for something to do because they're retired or, you know, they're financially stable in other aspects and they just want to do it for fun. And I wouldn't let them walk a hermit crab of mine because they just, they don't, they don't know yet. And that's just because they don't know yet. So I just wanted to get your opinion. Yeah, on it's, 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 I think from a training perspective, it's fine. It's good. Yeah, it's not going to hurt. Right. It's going to hurt anything. And it might help you in certain circumstances from a, uh, somebody looking to purchase services yeah. and there's other stuff you should look at. You would want to see, I like for me, the, the gauge uh, of someone's training ability is watching them with their own dogs. Yes. Right? Yes. Ultimately, that, that that's the proof is in the pudding. Like if I can, I can watch you with your dog for 10 minutes and I'll know if you're doing good dog training or not doing good dog training. Right. Exactly. Relatively quickly. Um, and so, uh, there, there's other things that the the person that's buying dog training should do to research the people that they're yeah, it's a good point. buying dog training from besides just saying, oh, they got certified by X organization, right? Yeah. So that's a bare minimum. You yeah. Want to yeah. And I think more. it, I think it comes down to as, as the time goes on, like you said, not only in the marketing standpoint from the dog trainer, but companies are just like, hey, we're going to start certifying dogs because the dog industry is getting big and there's money to be made. 
And I think mm-hmm. it's just like they're read this book, read that book. Okay, you're good. I had um, um, somebody ask me the other day about this, you know what type of certifications. I said, well, I don't really have any, but um, I, I help certify other dog trainers. I said, but I don't have. One. I said it's kind of an it, it's an awkward thing, but uh, you know because of my experience and my my um, my work I've done before, I've you know I've been able to do things like that for different colleges, and it's a it's a weird it's a weird thing. I think it's it's mm-hmm. frustrating for for. Your, uh, new trainers too. Cause they're, do I spend all, and I tell people like, don't, if you're really like pinched on money, go work for somebody for free. Just say, Hey, I'm, I'm new. I want to, I want to help out. Can I watch? Can I shadow? Can I, I think that's the best thing to do. It can, it, it, yeah. Certainly. If you, as long as you connect yourself to the right person and they're willing to. Yeah, like, exactly. Yeah. Be careful about shadow, but uh, like aside, from, aside from that. And, and I think like the continuing and it, continuing education aspect of it's really yeah, it's good. Hard. Yeah. Anything that encourages uh, trainers that already have businesses and things like that to continue to grow. Yeah. Is a good thing. And so some of the organizations that certify require continuing it a certain number of hours. Yeah. And you can get checked off in a lot of ways. You can go to a certain seminar that somebody's giving or and you can get checked off. I think pushing people to continue to better themselves is a good aspect of hundred percent. Right? So if you want to maintain that certification, then you're going to at least have to go sit in front of yeah. some, some different trainers, a certain number of hours a year, which is good for everybody. Everyone should be doing that. Like, yeah. if you, and the people that are serious about training are always yep. checking out people and watching what people are doing. They're, they're trying their best to expose themselves to new ideas all the time, but it sort of forces somebody that might be reluctant into sure. Yeah. Continuing their education. Yeah. That's why I was so bummed. Uh, we were going to come out, me and actually one of my trainers signed up for your e collar. Uh, I know. I know. Yeah. I'm going to, we're going to do them again. And, uh, and I'm about to probably do one uh, on Zoom. So, yes, I, I'm <laughs> down. But, I'm, yeah. We're, we're, we're about to run one there. So, yeah. To I'm so. totally down. I, cause I, I was so bummed. Cause, it, cause that's it, man. It's hard. It's hard sometimes when you're like, especially, you know, like I'm so passionate. I want to help, 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 teach, 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 give, 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 give. And I'm like, but I need to also make sure my, my knives are sharp too. I need to make sure that I'm not getting stagnant or I'm not, um, not being a sponge anymore. And I'm trying, that's why I'll just go into daycare. I'll just literally like, at least I can go into daycare and watch dogs and, Oh, that's interesting. And, and take, pull, pull things from dogs. Cause ultimately they're the masters at teaching. And you describe something that's hard for anybody once they get successful too. You're busy. And so you tend to like get insular. You're in your world. It's tough. And your your time is full. And so get it, continuing your personal growth is always hard. It's yeah. hard in all industries. It's the same thing for no matter what it is. Like you get good, you get busy, and now your personal growth takes a exactly hundred percent. And that's it. Doesn't mean that you're not giving people a good product, but yeah, you know, yeah, it's tough. It's tough, and that's why I like we were. I was so stoked to come out and hang out with. We were going to hang out with Forrest a couple of days before and. Uh, then, yeah. uh, but we'll, we'll do it. We'll, 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 over. we'll have it. We'll have an opportunity again. Yeah, this absolutely. Will, will, eventually we'll be back to yeah. something. And approaching. then, yeah. And then we'll, we'll wrap it up. I, um, but yeah, we'll, 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 we'll catch up again that, cause that was, that was something that we were all looking forward to. But, um, one thing before I forget too, <clears throat> is, um, the place I think you referred us to, I don't know. I think it was you cause you, you live there is the, um, the like, uh, there's like a, it's like a, village of places it's like a brewery and a winery and um oh, yeah the the barlow in sebastian yes that yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we went there and it, it changed <laughs> i was i've been wanting to go back there oh yeah for years i'm just like that that was like a little it was like a movie set almost where you're cool. walking and it's got all the lights and there's different just every every business is different and it was so cool and my girlfriend and i just we sat down and we had a beer here and wine here and you know being in california it was it was it was it was perfect so anyway so that was really really cool <laughs> well it's still there it's it's not <laughs> fully right now so wait till this is all over then come back out yeah out. yeah we're gonna um as as of everybody else too you know once things start to open up it's gonna be in the floodgate so um i definitely want to get out to to california again and, and do some stuff but um, so why don't you just tell people where they can where they can find you and how they can see the stuff that you're doing and interact with you on. So you have the Instagram and yeah. So um, yeah, I, I am uh, much less social media savvy than you, but we we definitely have a. Uh, it's the Michael Ellis School for Dog Trainers. We have a Facebook page. We have an Instagram, uh, and then our website. So it's MichaelEllisSchool.com, mm-hmm. and so um, all those things are uh, 
uh, uh, about to get super busy because we're, yeah. we're launching a new website and a lot of the online options, the the distance learning options are getting launched here in the ne- over the next two months. So that's awesome. Uh, so there would be a bunch of stuff happening there. So. Yeah, I remember. I remember you were developing when I, I took all those pictures last time I was there. Yeah, and, they were great. And I remember you developing your website then. So that's cool. I'm glad you're uh, getting rolling with that. Cool. Well, again, man, it was, it was a pleasure, absolute pleasure to talk Always to you. Always nice to talk to you, man. Yeah. Always. And when when, when uh, whenever this is over, I'll uh, hopefully be able to come out and we can take a rain check and come out and train some dogs and have some wine and have a good time. That'd be lovely. Cool. Thanks, Tom. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, Michael. Take care. Bye. I literally can't film anything outside today. It is so windy. But anyway, thank you guys so much for watching, listening. This is going to go live on my podcast tomorrow. So if you want to listen to this in audio format, all you have to do is head over to my podcast. I appreciate you guys watching. Michael, thanks for hopping on. I will talk to you guys next time. Peace. Peace.